Hi, welcome to the UWorld FNP QBank live review session. My name's LaQuisha. I've been a family nurse practitioner for four years, primarily in primary care practice, but I'm also a content developer here on the medical team at UWorld. I would like to introduce this FNP QBank to you. And today uh, we're going to go over four questions that are going to be seen on uh, the AANP and the ANCC examinations. They are the diagnosis, assessment, plan, and evaluation questions. Now for those taking the ANCC review, we do have clinical examination and professional role questions as well, which are the other two competencies that are seen on that exam. But I figured this would be a broad enough question bank that will cover both exams. Additionally, you can also use the UWorld FNP bank alongside your clinical coursework so that you can make sure that you understand those important concepts prior to graduation. Now, during this live review, I want to make sure that you understand that UWorld has I'm so sorry. UWorld has um, what is known as knowledge retention. And we have three concepts that are going to be seen on the majority of the questions, explanations that will help you to understand each concept that we're trying to teach you. Those three components are going to be a visual aid, which will be a photograph, an illustration, or a chart or graph of some sort bolded terms that is going to include the pertinent information that's needed for you to understand each concept and what's known as an educational objective which is basically a short concise summary of whatever the overall concept it is that we want you to um, make sure you take you bring home okay let's see let's go ahead and look at the first question here so this question is going to be a diagnosis question. This is the competency we're looking at currently. An 18 month old boy presents with clear rhinorrhea since yesterday, followed by fever and a harsh cough that began suddenly this morning. Temperature is 38.3 degrees Celsius, 100.9 degrees Fahrenheit, and respirations are 34 breaths per minute. Physical examination shows an alert child with auto strider, who has multiple episodes of loud, forceful coughing. The ears are filled with white nasal discharge. There are no rails or whizzes in the lungs. Intercostal and suprasternal retractions are present. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Now we have four answer options. A, bacterial pneumonia. B, croup, laryngotracheitis. C, epiglottitis. Or D, influenza. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to see if you can figure out what the correct answer is. Okay, for this answer, or for this question, the answer is B, croup, tracheitis. Now let's go through this question and break down the stem to see what the important things that we should pull from it. So for, we, for this question, we have the patient is an 18 month old boy. For croup, moving over to the explanation, we see that for epidemiology, typically, the age group is going to be six months to three years of age. Next part of the exam or next part of the STEM that we should pay attention to is he's alert and he has audible strider with multiple episodes of loud, forceful coughing. Now, this will be known as a barky cough, which is the key word. And according to the clinical features, inspiratory strider and barking cough are two of the main features that you're going to with patients that have croup. Now let's go through the wrong answers and see why they are wrong. In bacterial pneumonia, you typically will have a fever and you may have a cough, but fever is not something that is typically seen in that diagnosis. In C, 
epiglottitis, patients may present with fever and strider, but cough is not typically seen. And also, myalgias, rhinorrhea, and not present this way. Now, going back to you world's philosophy on knowledge retention, let's take a look at what's in the explanation. We have the uh, chart, croup laryngotracheitis. That is the first visual aid. In addition, you see the bolded terms, croup, barking, cough, hoarseness, and strider. Symptoms develop due to narrowing of the subglottic space. That's going to be the main point that we take away from that part of the paragraph. And once we get to the bottom here, the educational objective. Croup is a viral illness characterized by fever, rhinorrhea, sudden onset of a harsh barking cough, hoarseness, and strider. The most common etiology is the parainfluenza virus. So these are the three things that you always want to pay attention to when you get to uh, the explanation to make sure that you really get the point that we're trying to make. And we'll continue going through testing tips as we go throughout this live as well, just to kind of help you prepare as well. So let's go to the next question. Zoom in here. This is going to be an evaluation question. Okay, make sure you guys can see it there. All righty, a 53-year-old postmenopausal woman comes for a routine gynecological examination. Pelvic examination reveals no abnormalities. A pap test is performed, and the cervical cytology report specifies that there are atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, known as ASCUS. Which of the following is the best next step in management? So the four answer choices we have here are A, Diagnostic Loop Electrosurgical Excision Procedure, or LEAP. B, Human Papillomavirus Testing. C, No Additional Management Indicated. Or D, Repeat Cervical Cytology in Three Years. Let's give you a couple seconds to go through and see if you can come up with the correct answer. Okay, so for this question, the answer would be B, human papillomavirus testing. Let's go through the STEM like we did on the last question. We have a 53-year-old woman. She's postmenopausal. For this question, since it is an evaluation question, it is a screening question. It is a guideline question. So in following the screening guidelines, we have this lovely uh, visual aid. Uh, for ASCUS, the atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, it can be seen typically as it can be known as normal variation. But what makes a difference in the absence of the papillomavirus patient was HPV negative. You could just follow the same uh, screening guidelines and repeat testing in three years. But because she was HPV, if she was B, if she is HPV positive we would have to go on and do further investigation, which would be a colpopathy. So looking at the bolded images, boldings in our explanation, we have ASCUS is a common abnormal pap test result. Also, we want to make sure that it is not leading towards a cervical cancer or CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. That's why we have to get the HPV testing to determine which way we're going to go in the screening guidelines. Of course, if a patient is positive for HPV testing, they would be at increased risk for cervical cancer or malignancy, which is why colposcopy would be the correct uh, routes to follow after that, which is all indicated in the bolded terms that are in the explanation. And then the educational objective, which is our testing, to determine the risk of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or cervical cancer. A negative HPV test indicates no increased risk for malignancy. So let's move on to our next question. Okay, so zoom in on this image first. Give you a couple seconds to 
view the image before we get into the stem. Okay, now let's scroll here. We have a 20 year old man is evaluated for a rash. The rash began several months ago and became more noticeable over the summer after he started working as a lifeguard. Examination shows scattered macules across the shoulders, chest, and upper back, as shown above. After diagnostic confirmation, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? The answer choices would be A, corticosteroid ointment, B, intramuscular penicillin G, C, oral antihistamines, or D, selenium sulfide lotion. Give you a few seconds. For this question, the answer would be D, selenium sulfide lotion. So this is a plan competency question. So in actuality, this question is actually asking you two things. First, can you recognize what this image is showing you and know the correct diagnosis? But the main part of this question is, do you know how to treat the diagnosis? So for this, the answer is, the question is, is asking, do you know how to treat tinea versicolor, which is what this patient is presenting with? Now here's our, we have actually two images, the actual photograph and then the chart that kind of gives you an overview of what you should expect with tinea versicolor. This patient has a, a macular rash consistent with tinea versicolor, and it is for him hyperpigmented, but it could also be hypopigmented or salmon colored. It is typically gonna be seen in the upper trunk and it's gonna be worse in the summer months. Now looking back at the stem, he, worked, he noticed the rash after he began working as a lifeguard. Now why is that important in the stem? Two things, one, he's often wet, moist, and that makes it a perfect environment for this type of fungal infection to thrive. And two, he's often in the sun a lot. So he's gonna tan, which is gonna make that rash even more prominent, which is probably why he came in to be seen. So going back to our explanation, let's discuss why the other choices are incorrect. So topical corticosteroids are used for a lot of conditions, psoriasis, vitiligo, sometimes even in dermatitis. But because this is a function, it can actually make it worse. And that the steroids typically will decrease your skin's defenses and it will just allow that fungal infection to thrive. So you never want to put a steroid on a fungal infection. Choice B, penicillin G is the, the drug of choice for if uh, you have syphilis and which can also present as a macular, macular rash, but it's going to be more generalized. It's going to be all over the body, including the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. So since this rash is kind of just right on the chest, that's not the correct answer. And then C, oral antihistamines are used for uticaria, which is kind of itching, kind of presents quickly over time, but it's gonna be well circumscribed erythematous plaques, and it's gonna be very itchy with maybe wheels or hives, something that's gonna let you know it's like an allergic reaction. And typically those lesions resolve within a day or so, 24 hours or so. So since his is kind of getting worse over time, it's tanning, it's not going away, that would not be a correct answer. Whenever we're looking, and a test tip would be whenever we're looking at a question, if it does not say it in the stem, do not introduce it into the stem. Take it at face value. What you see is all you need to know. So for the educational objective, Tinea versicolor is a superficial fungal skin infection characterized by hyperpigmented, hypopigmented, or salmon-colored macules on the upper trunk of the extremities. It's often worse during the summer months. 
The diagnosis can be confirmed with a potassium hydroxide preparation of skin scrapings, and treatment includes topical selenium sulfide or ketoconazole. That is our takeaway for this question. Now we have one more question. Let's take a look at that now. Okay, so since we've been through everything else, all that is left now is our assessment question. A 31-year-old woman presents to discuss contraception options. The patient recently used an emergency contraceptive a week ago. She used combined oral contraceptives, COCs, in her early 20s and would like to restart them. The patient has occasional migraine headaches, which she describes as a throbbing pain on the right side of her face, preceded by flickering zigzags in her peripheral vision. Blood pressure is 130 over 80. Which of the following is a contraindication to the use of COCs in this patient? Option A, her blood pressure. B, history of migraine headaches. C, recent emergency contraception use. Or D, the patient has no contraindications to COCs. Let's see what you guys come up with. Okay, so for this one, the answer would be B, history of migraine headaches. Let's go through the stem. Now, what is this question asking? What are we looking for? Absolute contraindication to the use of COCs is the question that this is asking. Now, we know with contracept with COCs, the combined pills, we're going to have an estrogen or an, and a progesterone of some sort. Anytime a patient is on estrogen, it is going to increase their risk for ischemic stroke just due to changes in their hemostasis and how the body works. So if we know this patient already has a risk for an increase of stroke, we want to make sure that they don't have an actual, in, in their own history, risk that's going to increase that risk compounding with the risk that already comes with the medication itself. So which of these answer choices is going to increase the patient's risk for stroke outside of the medication itself? So blood pressure. Looking over in our explanation, we have this lovely chart. One bullet point in this list is 160, 100 blood pressure. Our patient is 130 over 80. So while it is stage one hypertension. It is not going to be a contra an absolute contraindication to her starting this medication. B, history of migraine headaches. Let's look at and look at the other two options. Recent emergency contraception use. Now, while using contraception emergent emergently is to maintain to uh, prevent a pregnancy, recent use is not going to be a contraindication to starting a new contraception method. So that's incorrect migraine headaches, so that's incorrect. Your correct answer. And looking at the explanation, look at our bolded terms. Estrogen containing combined hormonal contraceptives have more contraindications than other forms of contraception, like progesterone or copper IDs, due to alterations in the hemostasis and an increased risk of thrombosis and ischemic stroke and cardiovascular events that we discussed. Of course, zoomed in, um, the bolded migraines with aura, which is what the patient has, is a takeaway. So I'm going to go through and go to for this question. Migraine headache with aura is a contraindication to combine hormonal contraceptives at any age due to the impact of ischemic stroke. Other absolute contraindications include blood pressure greater than or equal to 160 over 100, and women age greater than or equal to 35 who smoke greater than or equal to 15 cigarettes per day. That is our main takeaway. Now, since this is our final question, let's see if we have any questions that you guys have.
Okay. So since we don't have any questions, we will be sure to uh, make sure we pay attention to the comments in case you think of any questions later. So we will be doing these UWorld FNP QBank live review sessions every other Friday for the month of July. So make sure that you subscribe to our channel, have alerts on so that you can receive any uh, of the... Uh, notifications that we're going to go live shortly. Also, make sure you look in our uh, description. There's a link to our, FN, our UWorld FNP QBank for you to try either a free trial or even for purchase options. Uh, and if you have anything that you want to see in the upcoming reviews, make sure you leave a comment so that we can look over that and see if we can add that to uh, our future uh, review sessions. I was good seeing you guys and until next time.